On March 1, 2023, the U.S. Navy officially renamed the warship, previously known as Chancellorville, to that of a former slave who bravely commandeered the Confederate ship CSS Planter during the Civil War. More on this coming up. This is KRT, Critical Race Theory. It's not the one they teach in law schools, but the one banned in public schools. On February 27, 2023, the Secretary of the Navy announced that a warship originally named after a Confederate Civil War victory would be renamed in honor of Robert Smalls. Robert Smalls was a former slave and heroic figure who risked everything to bring the CSS planter to the Union. Smalls was born in 1839 to Lydia Polite, an enslaved woman who worked as a servant in a house and grew up in the fields. He grew up in the city under the influence of the low country gullah culture of his mother. At the age of 12, Smalls was sent to Charleston to work as a laborer, earning only $1 out of the $16 that he made. Over the years, he worked various jobs on the docks and wharves, eventually becoming a wheelman. Despite his extensive knowledge of Charleston Harbor, due to his enslaved status, he was not permitted to hold the title of helmsman. At the age of 17, Smalls married Hannah Jones, who already had two daughters. They had a daughter and a son together, but their son died at the age of two. Smalls aimed to purchase his family's freedom, but the price was steep. It was $800, equivalent to $24,127 today. He had only $100, so it would have taken him decades to reach the required amount. In April 1861, the Civil War began with the Battle of Fort Sumter in nearby Charleston Harbor. That was in the fall of 1861. Smalls was assigned to steer the CSS Planter. It was a lightly armed Confederate military transport under the command of Charleston's district commander, Brigadier General Roswell Ripley. Planter's duties were to survey waterways, to lay mines, and to deliver dispatches, troops, and supplies. Smalls piloted the planter throughout Charleston Harbor and beyond on area rivers and along the South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida coast. From Charleston Harbor, Smalls and the planter's crew could see the line of federal blockade ships in the outer harbor seven miles away. Smalls appeared content and had the confidence of the planter's crew and owners, and at some time in April 1862, he began to plan an escape. He discussed the matter with all the other enslaved people on the crew, except one whom he did not trust. There's always one. Massa, they planning to escape. On May 12, 1862, the planner traveled 10 miles to southwest of Charleston to stop at Coles Island. It was a Confederate post on the Stono River that was being dismantled. There, the ship picked up four large guns to transport to a fort in Charleston Harbor. Back in Charleston, the crew loaded 200 pounds of ammunition and 20 cord of firewood onto the planter. That evening, the planter was docked as usual at the wharf below General Ripley's headquarters. As were their custom, its three white officers disembarked to spend the night ashore, leaving Small and the crew on board. Before they left, Smalls asked Captain Relia if the crew's families could visit, which was occasionally allowed, and he approved on condition that they depart before curfew. Now it's getting ready to go down. When the families arrived, the men revealed the plan to them. This was the first the women and children had heard of it. Although Smalls recently had told his wife, Hannah, she had known that Smalls longed to escape but hadn't realized that he was formulating a plan and intended to execute it. At first, she was not having it, but then she became ride or die. The other women cried and screamed when they learned what they had stumbled onto, and the men struggled to quiet them. Later, once the shock had worn off, those women admitted that they were glad for a chance at freedom. At some point, 
three crew members pretended to escort family members back home, but circled around and hid aboard another steamer docked at the North Atlantic Wharf. At 3 a.m. May 13th, Smalls and seven of the eight enslaved crewmen made their previously planned escape to the Union blockade ships. Smalls put on the captain's uniform and wore a straw hat similar to the captain's. He sailed the planner past what was then called Southern Wharf and stopped at another wharf to pick up his wife and children and the families of other crewmen. Smalls guided the ship past the five Confederate harbor forts without incident as he gave the correct steam whistle signals at checkpoints. The planner had been commanded by Captain Charles Relia and Smalls copied Relia's manners and straw hat on deck to fool Confederate onlookers from shore and the forts. The planner sailed past Fort Sumter around 4.30 a.m. As the nearly free slaves approached Fort Sumter, their apprehension grew. I bet. It was the most heavily armed Confederate forts and tended to be manned by the most suspicious soldiers. One of the men aboard later said, quote, when we drew near the fort, every man but Robert Smalls felt his knees giving way and the women began crying and praying. As the planner approached the fort, several men urged Smalls to give it a wide berth. Smalls refused, saying that such behavior would almost certainly arouse suspicion. He steered the ship along its normal path slowly as though he were merely enjoying the early morning air and in no particular hurry. When Fort Sumter flashed the challenge signal, Smalls again gave the correct hand signs. There was a long pause. The fort did not immediately respond, and Smalls now expected cannon fire to shred the planter at any moment. Finally, the fort signaled that all was well, and Smalls sailed his ship out of the harbor. The alarm was only raised after the ship was beyond gun range. Rather than turn east toward Morris Island, Smalls headed straight for the Union Navy fleet. Next, he replaced the rebel flags with a white bedsheet which was brought by his wife. The planner had been seen by the USS Onward, which was about to fire until a crewman spotted the white flag. In the dark, the sheet was difficult to see, but the sunrise arrived, which allowed viewing. Just as the number three port gun was being elevated, someone cried out, quote, I see something that looks like a white flag. When they discovered that Onward would not fire on them, there was a rush of contrabands out of her deck. Some dancing, some singing, whistling, jumping, and others stood looking toward Fort Sumter. As the steamer came near and under the stern of the Onward, one of the men stepped forward took off his hat and shouted, Good morning, sir. I brought you some of the old United States guns, sir. That man was Robert Smalls. The onwards captain boarded the planner and Smalls asked for a United States flag to display. He surrendered the planner and its cargo to the United States Navy. His escape plan had succeeded. In addition to its own light guns, planner carried the four loose artillery pieces from Coles Island and 200 pounds of ammunition. Most valuable, however, were the captain's code book containing the Confederate signals and a map of the mines and torpedoes that had been left in Charleston Harbor. Southern newspapers demanded harsh discipline for the Confederate officers whose shore leave had allowed Smalls and his men to steal the boat. Afterwards, the three Confederate officers were court-martialed and two convicted, but the verdicts were later overturned. Robert Smalls was a significant figure during the American Civil War. He was awarded prize money for the capture of a boat that earned him $1,500. That's equivalent to $40,715 today. He was then invited to New York to raise money for formerly enslaved individuals, but the proposal was vetoed and Smalls started serving in the Union Navy. In August 1862, Smalls went to Washington, D.C. to persuade President Lincoln and Secretary of War Edwin Stanton to permit black men to fight for the Union. Stanton soon signed an order 
allowing up to 5,000 African Americans to enlist in the Union forces at Point Royal. Smalls became the pilot of the Crusader under Captain Alexander Rind and later the USS Keokuk. Throughout his life, Robert Smalls continued to work for the betterment of his community. He served in the South Carolina State Assembly and the U.S. House of Representatives and fought for civil rights and voting rights for African Americans. Smalls was a brave and inspiring figure who played a significant role in American history. This has been Critical Race Theory. Thanks for checking in. Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe and share this video with your friends and family. I'll see you next time.